In 2003, Paul Martino co-founded Tribe.net, one of the earliest social networking sites. Tribe had significant traction with hundreds of thousands of users. In the early 2000s, hundreds of thousands of users were enough traffic to pose a company with engineering challenges. Paul had studied computer science and was able to use his knowledge of high-performance computing to write an efficient graph database and solve the other technical puzzles that the company faced. But the business ultimately did not work out. The failure of Tribe made the founders of Tribe even hungrier for success, and it taught them lessons that they carried into subsequent businesses. Paul went on to start Aggregate Knowledge, a marketing technology company that sold for $119 million. His Tribe co-founder, Mark Pincus, went on to start Zynga, the multi-billion dollar gaming company. Another Tribe employee co-founded Yammer, which sold to Microsoft for a billion dollars. Since his exit from aggregate knowledge, Paul Martino started Bullpen Capital, which makes post-seed investments. The Bullpen Capital portfolio is appealing to me partly because of the number of internet gambling companies. Paul and I talked about gambling and other taboo business sectors, as well as what makes a good investment in the post-seed category. I enjoyed speaking to Paul because he has a straightforward and no-nonsense way of talking about things. It's very charismatic and uncommon, and you'll see what I mean when you hear him talk. We've done some great episodes with other engineering investors like Chris Dixon and Adrian Collier, and you can find these old episodes by downloading the free Software Engineering Daily app for iOS and for Android. In other podcast players, you can only access the most 100 recent episodes, and in this, these, these apps, you can access all of our old episodes. You can search over it. You can get recommendations based on the content that you've listened to. And they're open sourced at github.com slash software engineering daily. If you're looking for an open source project to get involved with, we would love to get your help. A shout out to today's featured contributor to the Software Engineering Daily open source project, Kurian Vithayathil. He has made significant contributions to the Software Engineering Daily Android app, and all of the users of the Software Engineering Daily Android app, I'm sure, appreciate his work. Thanks again, Kurian, for all your efforts. Now let's get on with this episode. DigitalOcean Spaces gives you simple object storage with a beautiful user interface. You need an easy way to host objects like images and videos. Your users need to upload objects like PDFs and music files. DigitalOcean built Spaces because every application uses object storage. Spaces simplifies object storage with automatic scalability, reliability, and low cost. But the user interface takes it over the top. I've built a lot of web applications, and I always use some kind of object storage. The other object storage dashboards that I've used are confusing, they're painful, and they feel like they were built 10 years ago. DigitalOcean Spaces is modern object storage with a modern UI that you will love to use. It's like the UI for Dropbox, but with the pricing of a raw object storage. I almost want to use it like a consumer product. To try DigitalOcean Spaces, go to do.co slash sedaily and get two months of Spaces plus a $10 credit to use on any other DigitalOcean products. You get this credit even if you have been with DigitalOcean for a while. You can spend it on Spaces or you can spend it on anything else in DigitalOcean. And it's a nice added bonus just for trying out Spaces. The pricing is simple. $5 per month, which includes 250 gigabytes of storage, and one terabyte of outbound bandwidth. There are no costs per request, and additional storage is priced at the lowest rate available, just a cent per gigabyte transferred and two cents per gigabyte stored. There won't be any surprises on your bill. DigitalOcean simplifies the cloud. They look for every opportunity to remove friction from a developer's experience. I'm already using DigitalOcean Spaces to host music and video files for a product that I'm building, and I love it. I think you will too. Check it out at do.co slash sedaily and get that free $10 credit in addition to two months of spaces for free. That's do.co slash sedaily. Paul 
Martino is the manager of Bullpen Capital, which he founded. He also founded and ran Aggregate Knowledge. He studied computer science at Princeton, and he's started some other companies. Paul, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Glad to be here. Let's go back a little bit to Tribe in 2003. This was a social networking site. What was the engineering stack of a social network in 2003? Yeah, so it was, that's a really interesting question. So I had a architect named Brian Lawler, uh, who ended up then going to Cisco for many years. And I was a high-performance computing guy. And so when we had seen sites like Friendster and we'd seen the scalability issues they had, we realized that we basically needed to separate the stack into two halves. We needed a very traditional, what I would call web stack for front end, all that. And then for the social networking functions, we needed to some extent an HPC stack. So I, from scratch, designed a C-based set of libraries that got called by the web stack to do things like compute social distance, Mm. maintain the social network. So we had user IDs, for example, that were just integers sitting inside of a graph database, 100% custom code, 100% custom code. And Brian Lawler, basically, I exposed an API to him that he'd call over a socket, and he would then integrate to all the social networking features, and his stack then looked like a very traditional, you know, LAMP-ish stack. It was a Java stack, but nothing, nothing that looked unusual. So there's this one proprietary box that you call over 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 the socket that's all the cool stuff I do. I'm not a web developer at all, so I don't understand squat that Brian's doing. He doesn't understand squat of what I'm doing, but that actually made it perfect because the, the separation of responsibilities between the two things. And so as Tribe grew, and while it never got as big as some of the other ones, we never had the scalability problems with other people because we separated... We, we understood that there'd be massive difference in the scalability of social networking functions from traditional web development functions. And if you try to do things like compute social distance inside of your database or inside of your web stack, you knew you were screwed. Mm-hmm. So we took all that out and you know, we, we really never had a scalability problem a day of the company. You had to write your own graph database? Yeah, wrote it from scratch. That's mm-hmm. my background. So that, I was perfectly equipped to do that. So my work at Princeton was in high performance computing. Mm -hmm. Doing things like a graph database are the kinds of things that I built from scratch for my PhD work. Mm -hmm. And so designing one of them, brushing off some stuff that was kind of five-ish years old from my work there and applying that to a social network situation, was that was a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like that was a great fit for you, that position. Uh, I saw an interview where you said that one of the mistakes that the company made mm-hmm. tribe was a inability to focus on what was most important what was the particular mistake in in focus what should you have been focused on and what were you focused on there were two mistakes and pincus and i and val syme and 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 the whole gang chris law we we've we talk about this off and on for the decade that has gone by since there were two fundamental mistakes we made. Let's start with the, the one user one and then the kind of one focus one. The user one was that we didn't pay any att- attention to curating who our initial user base was. And so Friendster at the time was going through a purge of all the Burning Man people. And guess what? All the Burning Man people came over to Tribe and we had the most alternative post yourself naked crowd mm. anywhere. We never thought this was a problem because a social network should take all comers, right? Well, a guy named Zuckerberg shows up a couple of years later and starts with a highly curated, desirable audience called Harvard mm-hmm. and slowly expands it by schools. So the fundamental problem with us as a social network is we didn't understand how important the, the core audience that we started with was and how the users themselves set the tone for your site. It was out of your control once a certain group basically took over your site. Mm. And it's not that we didn't love those people. It's that they were not mainstream enough to cross over to make it be the big site. Mm -hmm. So that was problem one in kind of 1A. But problem two was the original thesis of Tribe was not to be a general purpose social network. It was to try and do the socially networked classifieds. Pincus's vision was to use social networking as a way in which you know who's on the other end of a Craigslist style transaction. So the focus problem was every day you'd come into the office, are we building a social network or are we building a Craigslist killer? Hmm. That is a very tough company to work for because one day you're doing listings functionality and the other day you're doing social network features. And Elliot Lowe, who was our designer, who went on to do Yammer, he once said, he says, here's the problem we got at Tribe. Hey guys, let's all go hang out on our social network so we can do classifieds. 
right? I mean, you don't all go in a room together so you can sell your used car to your buddy. You go hang out with your buddies so you can, you know, play a game of poker or something, which, by the way, became Zynga. So we kind of all learned from our mistakes. We really did a lot of introspection about what went wrong. And, you know, aggregate knowledge was a, a, a byproduct of that. Zynga was a byproduct of that. Mm. So it was pretty cool. Yammer was a byproduct of that. So it's kind of cool that that team went on to do such interesting things immediately thereafter, even though we got that one wrong. Mm-hmm. What was the way in which the lessons from Tribe led you down the idea maze to aggregate knowledge? That one was straightforward. We knew that the data exhaust coming off a social network was going to be super predictive for everything that you'd want to do, whether it be ad targeting, whether it be finding you another friend, et cetera. So even though we were at Tribe and Tribe was failing, I, I kept telling Pincus and the gang, I'm like, dude, the data exhaust coming off this thing is just mind bogglingly awesome. No one's ever had a data set like this. You know, what if I brought a kind of, you know, data collection in a box service to a bunch of big companies let them do that to do product recommendations, ad targeting, mm-hmm. retargeting. And those were, the, those were the thinkings behind aggregate knowledge. And aggregate knowledge ended up being a, a very successful company as a result of that. So I have that insight. Pincus has the insight, which is there's nothing else to do on your social network once your friends are there. So let's <laughs> give them something else to do. Quite, quite simply stated. Mm-hmm. Let's let them play poker. Yep. Um, and Elliot, by the way, leaves. He teams up with Dave Sachs. He does this thing called Yammer, which is, why don't we kind of do the social networking thing for the enterprise? Mm-hmm. All three of those companies almost certainly don't turn out the way they do unless we were all tribe together. Spring Framework gives developers an environment for building cloud-native projects. On December 4th through 7th, Spring One Platform is coming to San Francisco. Spring One Platform is a conference where developers congregate to explore the latest technologies in the Spring ecosystem and beyond. Speakers at Spring One Platform include Eric Brewer, who created the Cap Theorem, Vaughn Vernon, who writes extensively about domain-driven design, and many thought leaders in the Spring ecosystem. Spring One Platform is the premier conference for those who build, deploy, and run cloud-native software. Software Engineering Daily listeners can sign up with the discount code SEDAILY100 and receive $100 off of a Spring One Platform conference pass while also supporting Software Engineering Daily. I will also be at Spring One reporting on developments in the cloud native ecosystem. I would love to see you there and have a discussion with you. Join me December 4th through 7th at the Spring One Platform conference. And use discount code SEDAILY100 for $100 off of your conference pass. That's SEDAILY100, all one word for the promo code. Thanks to Pivotal for organizing Spring One Platform and for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. There was some moment in aggregate knowledge where the business was not working Mm -hmm. and you had to essentially look at your resources, evaluate what was working, evaluate what was not working, do some tweaks and pivot, I guess is the word you would use. Or, and it's, I I have heard you talk about this in a, a number of different contexts, both specifically about aggregate knowledge and more generally like the strategies for pivoting. Can you, Take us to that moment when you had to reframe the company and talk about the lessons and how that might generalize to people who are in a similar state of mind. Okay, so yes, I'm happy to talk about it, but I don't think it's a very reusable story and you'll see why. <laughs> okay. Th- this is an unusual, this was no pivot. This was no, this was a, oh my God, we have $25 million in the bank and the business we think we're in doesn't exist. What the F are we going to do? This was a very, very unusual situation. We started as recommendations as a web service. Remember, the big idea is kind of data collection in a box, cut and paste JavaScript, turn your website into a data mining effort for your company. And the first product is recommendations as a web service, Mm -hmm. which is a very logical way to use that data. Well, out of the gate, we start making a couple million dollars. We get this big contract with Overstock. We got the Washington Post. We've got... 
we think, and to some extent, wow, this was a little too easy. You know, we go from zero to a couple million dollars in revenue overnight. Everybody and their brother is trying to throw us money, and so we raise a $20 million round. About six months into the $20 million round with $25 million in the bank, because we didn't really touch any of the $20 million bucks, a bunch of these copycats show up. A bunch of other guys are doing cut and paste JavaScript ad recommendations to web service. And we're down one year into our first contracts and no one wants to renew. And they want to pay us one-tenth of the price. And they, all of the things that you sit there and go, oh, my God, we don't have a business. And so I remember the board meeting clear as day. It was in January of 08. I walk into the board meeting and I go, guys, we got $25 million in the bank. The business that we're in is not a business. We need to figure out what else we're going to do. And Randy Komisar from Kleiner, uh, bless him, and we've been best friends ever since. He looked at me. He said, you know, Paul, you got a great team here. You've built an interesting piece of core technology. I think nine out of 10 people in my position would fire you right now. But you know what? I'm going to do something different. You got six months to figure out what else the hell you're going to do with this. Hmm. And oh, by the way, that was then the luckiest break of my career. About two months later, a guy named John Donahue calls me up cold from uh, Omnicom Media Group. Like, Omnicom Media Group, what's, what's an ad company? I don't even really know what ad companies are. I'm selling enterprise software to, to big guys. He says, well, Paul, you know, um, I know one of the back end systems you use at Aggregate Knowledge is this thing called Aster Data, which is one of your data warehouses. We were Aster Data's second customer. Aster went on to become part of Teradata. So he calls me up, he's doing a reference call. He's like, Paul, I want to do this nonlinear analysis. I want to do all this cool attribution. I want to tell my customers, you know, why people are buying, you know, you know, Chef Boy RD in the morning and why college kids eat it cold. And I'm like, dude, Aster is a database. Like, could you tell me again what you're trying to do? He's like, I'm trying to build basically a multi-point attribution system to tell advertisers why people are doing what they're doing. Mm. I'm sitting there and I'm going, well, shit, that's what our underlying core technology was built for. What is a recommendation? A recommendation is a composite score of the thing you'll probably be interested in based on your past behavior. Mm -hmm. But if you turn your head 90 degrees, this attribution thing that this crazy guy named John Donahue, who I've never met in my life, is asking for is exactly what we built. But I'm not an ad tech guy. There ain't a single ad tech person in the company. And so I call up John. I go, John could you come over to our office and maybe tell us a little more about what you do? And so that's March. January is the board meeting. And by June, Omnicom is going to invest in the company. John Nelson, the CEO of Organics, is going to join the board. This guy named Steve Cattleman's in our product advisory group. And we figured out that the business is to actually apply this core tech into this multi-point attribution problem. Mm. This became known as the first DMP. Aggregate knowledge, because of that reference phone call from John Donahue, created the industry of DMP. Hmm. We had actually already built it, but no one knew we had built it because we used it for the wrong damn thing. So this is why I'm saying the story I don't think is tremendously reusable. It's not a lot of times that a CEO walks into a board meeting and says, I need to find a new business. A doesn't get fired. B gets enough time to figure it out. Hmm. And then C gets the lucky reference phone call that is the new business literally land in his desk. Hmm. And so that was a crazy six months why, of, why, of endeavor. Why was the recommendation system as a service the first the, that first idea? Why was that such a commodity business? That sounds like a business where you could build a moat by having a recommendation as a service that's 10x better than everybody else. You can't. It turns out that the 80-20 rule applies here very badly, not in your favor. The very simple thing gets you 80% of what mm. you want. I mean, really, it's just a simple, like, yes, our system could get you, you know, if you did the Netflix prize, which was going on at the time. So the best systems were, you know, a 10 point percent lift. Well, you know, the thing you could build over a weekend would get you six to eight points. So if the thing you could build over the weekend internally get you six to eight points of lift in, say, product views or cross sell, why are you going to pay me? a hundred thousand to a million dollars incremental to get you from 8% lift of your metric to 10%. Mm. And so the 80, 20 rule totally screwed you. And we thought we could make it up in volume. We thought by having the aggregated databases across all other customers, we would get essentially unified knowledge. Hence the name of the company, aggregate knowledge. We would, we would learn patterns, et cetera, off the data from others, but that gave such incremental in, ad, additional lift that it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why, by the way, 10 years later, name me that great recommendation company that went public. Hmm. 
And so I feel good about what we did because of that. Now, if on the other hand, there are five public companies and that's a huge category like search or whatever, I go, man, yeah. we screwed up. But the fact that the market has spoken, there is no big, awesome public company in that product. We were just either early enough or dumb enough to call the ball that that didn't work and look for the new business. It's funny because that problem is not dissimilar from search. Recommendations are not dissimilar from search, but I guess there's something different about search that makes it... Uh, the ability to monetize is significantly different. Mm -hmm. Recommendations are in the discovery category, which is when you don't know what you're looking for but are open to a suggestion. Search, on the other hand, is directed and has ah. much more monetizable intent because right now I need blank. So don't get me wrong, the discovery thing is awesome. And by the yeah. way, the web discovery is still broken. Mobile <laughs> yeah. discovery is still, you know, a decade, more than a decade after the formation of aggregate knowledge, which we called ourselves the leader in online discovery, uh -huh. the discovery problem is still awful. Yeah. There still could be a great company to go be the discovery company, but since the intent is not so directly monetizable, you don't have those economics of something like search. Hmm. What mistakes have you seen founders making since the days you started as an entrepreneur so you you had you were you worked at tribe you worked at aggregate knowledge the first one was maybe a failure but not really because it led to such successes later aggregate knowledge was a definitive success and now you work at bullpen capital you've had uh, a lot of really smart investments you've got a really differentiated investment thesis so you've kind of seen a lot of stuff what are the mistakes that you see people continuing to make that you saw even from the early days people making there are a bunch of them, but the, I think, let me go through the ones that are my pet peeves to some extent. Not understanding the competitive landscape of what you're going into. This one always makes me crazy. I'm going to just go build the best product. I'm not going to pay any attention to what anybody else is doing. When I meet an entrepreneur who does that, it, it, it just, it speaks to an intellectual laziness that bugs me. And I, I call him out on it. I'm like, no, you are not the first person to do blank photo sharing, ad targeting, etc. You have to be a student of the business that you're going into. You need to study from the failures of the people before you, and you need to look at what's in the market now to inform your decision about what you're doing and how it can be differentiated. And when the answer comes back kind of like, oh, dude, but what I'm doing is so awesome and so cool, like everyone will love it. I'm like, yeah, maybe. Or maybe what you're doing is an exact copy of 37 things before you that failed. Hmm. So when I have an entrepreneur come into my office and kind of talk about their product like they're the only person who's ever thought of or conceived of this, I view that as a really self-inflicted wound on the part of the entrepreneur. Be a student of the business you want to run. Be a student of the category you're going to disrupt. Show me that you have commanding knowledge of both the successes and the failures and why what you're doing is really different or the time is right. And I see all too frequently people get too lazy about this part of the problem and go, I'll just build a better product. And that's their answer to all of those questions. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is certainly one. Another pet peeve I, I guess I would describe is people who view that fundraising is beneath them, meaning let me get back to building my product. That's all that matters. I'm like, no, dude, you're the CEO of the company. Not running out of money is part of your job. So, hmm. so how can you come into my office now? I'm on the other side of the table, of course. But even when I was an angel or advisor, I go, no, you can't just spend 99% of your day building your product. You need to hire people. You need to grow your management team. You need to raise money. You need to get an office. You need to scale. And if all you want to do is be the product person, great. Go fire yourself the CEO and become the <laughs> VP of product. Please bring in a CEO who's capable of wanting to raise money and do all the stuff that they need to do. Yeah. Is the serialization of uh, building versus raising money necessary? Because you hear some people that say you should block off three months and spend that time completely focused on fundraising. Nope, I totally disagree. I actually wrote an article on TechCrunch a couple of years ago called Seed is a Process. Hmm. And the basic thinking is that logic of monolithic fundraising was correct maybe 10 years ago when I was doing aggregate, aggregate knowledge. But as the fundraising has become more continuous, multiple cap notes, rolling notes, a seed, a post seed, a pre seed, all oh, before you get to an A. Right. If you take 10% of your time, all the time fundraising, yeah. you actually have a much more healthy balance as the CEO, by the way. You're now not out of the office for three months and everything might go to hell because it's a 10 person company. Yeah. You know, so let's say 10% of your time all the time, 
Yeah. That's a way more healthy thing for both your business. And oh, by the way, the ecosystem supports that now because right. fundraising is a more continuous process, whereas it was so dang discreet in the mid OOs. And the pool of people is bigger because 10 years ago, there was the risk of you shop around for two months and then everybody's heard about you. And if you still haven't raised money, there's some risk there that you've poisoned the well. But there's so many people now that there's much less risk. And there's so many different deals. That's that, right. And you're just talking to those people continuously. Yeah. And you're getting lunch with somebody when you're not in market. And someone might preempt you when you're not ready. And, and it's way... It is so much more awesome to be an entrepreneur in this ecosystem of always be raising seed as a process. And even though that article is a couple of years old, I... I probably refer an entrepreneur to that article two, three times a week, hmm. not because I wrote it and I want to get my uh, my views up, but because the content of that article really describes a change in mentality that happened this decade versus the last decade that I think every once in a while I see an entrepreneur who raised money a decade ago, was at a big company for a decade and then comes into this world. And I'm like, no, it's all different. Hmm. Like seriously, like forget what you know when you raise money in 05 and 06 because it just, it's like a tectonic shift happened. Once First Round Capital, who I really view as the true innovator on this, went out and did their model. First Round started 04 and then really hit stride called 07. You get past the, the economic crisis of 08. You're raising money on the backside of 08. You're in a different, the rules are all different because you have this massive proliferation of seed. You have higher volume investors. You have all these incubators. It, it's just so cool what happened. Mm -hmm. You founded Bullpen Capital, and the investment strategy is to put in money after a company has proven product market fit, has a sight line to a milestone, and has a strong syndicate of existing investors. You call this post-seed. Briefly explain why this is a specific set of characteristics that make for a good investment criteria, and then we can talk about why that is different and why it is good. Bullpen Capital got started as a math problem. So I'm a high-performance computing geek, as, as evidenced by most of what we're talking about right now. A guy named Mike Maples calls me up in 09, beginning, uh, end of 09, says to me, basically, you know, Paul, the whole venture ecosystem is restructuring. Your buddy Josh Koppelman figured out the seed thing, and, you know, there's this guy Jeff Clavier over at Soft Tech, and, you know, they're all your buddies, and... I'm an, I'm an early LP in first round. And he's like, you realize the way that people are investing in seed now is different. It's more, more checks, fail fast, don't invest in every round unless you got a winner. Venture up to that point in time was invest in every round, invest before the product's there, have huge ownership targets. And so Mike and Jeff and Josh, I kind of, in my mind, three of the real innovators of this figured out a kind of different way to play once it got so cheap to start a company. So if on the left, in the early stage, you have lower ownership targets, higher volume, fail fast, and on the right, life cycle, need to invest in every round, got to own 20%, isn't it a certainty, almost like you know the whole hawking radiation thing, that there must be an event horizon in between those two business models? Aren't the business models of traditional venture and early stage venture now incompatible? Hmm. And so we literally did the math on it. We spent a lot of time. We did a roadshow. Duncan hmm. Davidson and Rich Melman and I sat at a whiteboard for six months figuring out that the new ecosystem would lead to downstream opportunities, including what we now call the post-seed opportunity, which is extending the seed mentality to the Series A round. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the post-seed round is a small A. Mm -hmm. It's a $4 million round now. Right. It used to be $2 million. Now it's a $4 million round. Shit, when you were raising money back in 05, you raised a Series A, it was four or five million bucks. That's what you did. Mm -hmm. So we have a joke in our office to make venture great again, right? Mm -hmm. The reason we use that joke is because our product is the product that we knew was the Series A product 12 years ago. Because the uh, Series A product now has become this $12, $15, 18000000 million thing because the later stage funds got the front of the funnel stolen by all the new kids right. and had to write bigger checks later. So we're playing this kind of fundamental long-term structural arbitrage between the two venture business models. Now, what's cool about that is the math told us that it would exist, mm -hmm. but guess what? No one told us how to pick the companies. Mm. We had a half a loaf of bread. The math problem said, go swim in this pool. Right. A great lesson I learned from Mark Pincus. Tribe was a failed social network, but we were swimming in the right pond. Right. So we know we're swimming in the right pond because the math has told us 
the event horizon between seed and A is going to have massive opportunity. Right. What we started figuring out, it was capital-efficient companies that had already gotten product market fit that were a year away from making the big funds want to dump a lot of money in. Mm-hmm. Right, okay, so... Hence this kind of bizarre thing you see on the website of the characteristics of what we're looking for. Right, and so early-stage investors, like the really early stage, when you're talking about Angel or the seed round... They're often looking at the founders, they're looking at the markets that they think will develop, they're maybe looking at a very raw prototype, and that's how they make their decision to put in, you know, if it's a, if it's an angel round, they're putting in 100000 to $250,000. If it's a seed round, maybe they're putting in 500000 to $1.5 million. And then the growth stage, or the late stage, or like Series A, Series B, they're putting in, like you said, $10 million or $20 million or $30 million or something, and you're talking about this round that is somewhere in between. What are the data points that you're looking at, or what are you looking at during the diligence process? How does your diligence process and what you're examining differ from what the people in the rounds on either side of you are looking at? The main difference is that we invert the pyramid with a very moneyball style approach, just like what Billy Bean does with players. Of course I care if the team's awesome. Of course I care if the market's big. But shouldn't I look at the raw numbers of the business first before I invite you into the office? Hmm. Most venture firms, is it a category I like? Did the kid go to a school with great resume? Is it out of a company I like? That's the first screen. That's our last screen. Our opening screen is... Is the company at a half million to a million in revenue? Did they raise no more than three million bucks? Is their burn rate no more than 100K? We start with all the money ball in the front, and we don't even invite you to come into the office unless you're through the money ball. Hmm. But once you're through the money ball, then we do all the, the founder got the chops. Is the market big enough? Is the team going to get there? But we, we have a massive hack that makes the use of our time and our partnership so much more efficient because we use an analytics-based screen on the front end of the process that the later stage firms do, the private equity firms do this, but the vast majority of early stage investors don't because they start with kind of the raw materials. This leads to a very, to some extent, difficult and arduous diligence process if you start in the softer factors. But letting the softer factors be the second half of our diligence process instead of the first half leads to a really different experience. By the way, if you're an entrepreneur, you talk to our even, even CEOs who get no's from us, they'll tell you, well, wow, talking to Bullpen was really different. Like, I went in there and we went through a spreadsheet and they said, here's three reasons why I'm not the right person for you. By the way, in six months I might be, so come on back. Yeah. And, and, and the feedback was super analytical, super focused, and actually super useful because they have such a clear thing that they do as opposed to, well, you know, if if you uh, if you wore a, a nicer tie with your suit, you know maybe, <laughs> and you know if you, you get a founder who went to a school that was a little sexier than you know what I mean, like you get this feedback a lot of times from the venture ecosystem that's kind of not really directionally useful. Right. I, I think our nose are, are among some of our best marketing message. I mean, I I don't say that facetiously. It's because numerical I say them, criterion. Yeah, I'm like, look. You're at 10000 a month as a SaaS company. I need you to be at fifty to 100 yeah. and here's why. Because the next fund after me wants you to be at 400 And so if you grow at 4x a year and I go through the math, they're like, wow, dude, this is kind of cool. Like, you really showed me how the ecosystem worked. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, because you know why? I'm a student of the venture industry the way I want you to be a student of your business. Mm-hmm. And I think this is why going back to my earlier question about my pet peeve, how many venture people do you meet that you'd really say they're a student of the venture business, Mm. where you walk in and go, do you really wake up in the morning and ask yourself, how can I innovate on venture? Mm. Do you wake up in the morning and say, what is everybody else doing so I can be smarter? The vast majority of people in venture lose that gene, even if they were former entrepreneurs, and they just go, my brand is better, I'm better looking, come in and do a deal with me, and that bugs me. But guys like Koppelman, et cetera, continue to innovate, and they're my heroes. The octopus, a sea creature known for its intelligence and flexibility. Octopus Deploy, a friendly deployment automation tool for deploying applications like .NET apps, Java apps, and more. Ask any developer and they'll tell you that it's never fun pushing code at 5pm on a Friday 
and then crossing your fingers, hoping for the best. We've all been there. We've all done that. And that's where Octopus Deploy comes into the picture. Octopus Deploy is a friendly deployment automation tool, taking over where your build or CI server ends. Use Octopus to promote releases on-prem or to the cloud. Octopus integrates with your existing build pipeline, TFS and VSTS, Bamboo, TeamCity, and Jenkins. It integrates with AWS, Azure, and on-prem environments. You can reliably and repeatedly deploy your .NET and Java apps and more. If you can package it, Octopus can deploy it. It's quick and easy to install, and you can just go to octopus.com to trial Octopus free for 45 days. That's octopus.com, O-C-T-O-P-U-S dot com. Well, I mean, I hear a lot of phrasing that is opaque or touchy-feely, and you're laying out, like you said, the money ball, the very numerical-driven approach. And, you know, maybe we'll talk about this with poker later on, but I remember when back when I was playing poker full-time, there were people who would succeed at high stakes and would have very fuzzy reasoning for why they made a certain play. Oftentimes, that fuzzy reasoning was an abstraction over some harder numbers that they probably had internalized. Maybe they couldn't express it externally. But the people who were extremely successful were always the ones who could communicate using numbers and probabilities and very tangible reasoning why they made a decision and became much easier to communicate with those people and share information also. And that's probably another reason why they thrive was because they could put things numerically. And mm-hmm. it sounds like that's 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 a position that you like to take with them. That's absolutely right. And by the way, the intuitive investor is very successful in venture. Mm. We, we see the same thing in venture. Yeah. There are, there are truly gifted people at looking at a website or a mobile app or a, meeting an a, a, a entrepreneur for five minutes and knowing if they're going to be a winner. Yeah. That is a unique, untrainable, unlearnable skill in my opinion. You were yeah. born with that or not. Mm-hmm. And so if you're one of those savants, if you're you know, one of those style of poker players, great. Build your brand. Go get those people to come into your office. You're going to continue to pick them well. Yeah. But you know, if you're kind of not and you're more a numbers geek who used to be a high-performance computing guy, this is probably what you're going to go do. Yep. Right? This, this model matches the temperament of its founding team and of the people who are now here. And, you know, in, in many ways, I, I think we're demonstrating that there's a metrics way to go after some aspects of venture that were touchy-feely. Mm-hmm. Speaking of gambling, Bullpen has made a lot of investments in gambling, and I find this a really interesting topic. Uh, I've, I've always been fascinated by gambling internet companies because it's a thing that gambling is taboo. And it's a thing that I don't think should be taboo, or I wish there was less taboo with it. But it's it's refreshing to see somebody that that makes a lot of investments in the intersection of gambling and the internet. I actually think there's a lot of utility potentially if the taboo were removed, and you know you can gamify all these things in the real world with gambling elements. That would be great, but that's not going to happen for a while until the taboos kind of disappear. What do you see as happening at the intersection of gambling and the internet today in 2017? So it, it's even slightly broader. Our fund is not afraid of not just gambling and gaming. It's not afraid of legal and regulatory risk. We have two cannabis companies and an alcohol delivery company in addition to seven companies, broadly speaking, in gaming. You know, we have a fantasy company. We have a lottery company. We have a horse racing company. And I'm very proud of that aspect of our portfolio because the vast majority of these deals are deals that are just too frightening for the rest of the venture ecosystem to contemplate. But we've now developed quite a reputation as having understanding and a lack of fear of potential liability, legal and regulatory framework. We work a lot with a guy named Bradley Tusk who did this for a company called Uber back in the day. And we found that this is... 
there's real alpha here. There's real money to be made by saying, I raised my hand. I'm not scared of this stuff. I want you to come in here. So it is nice because for the prior two years when I got asked that question, I would get asked, you know, Martino, you're going to do a cannabis deal, aren't you? And I would say, I would say, yes, I think it is inevitable. And so then a year or two later, we now have done two. Of course we've done two because we're not going to be afraid. We didn't have the right ones come in at that point in time. Most of them were, say, in the, 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 the actual growing side, which didn't seem to be a venture-style business. Uh, but we get into a cool company called Herb.co up in Canada. It's the largest information portal about cannabis anywhere. And we sit there and go, that's the kind of bet we can make. And, you know, we get excited about that. And so, uh, you know, we, we kind of say we, we got quite a bit of vice exposure, and vice is not necessarily so bad. Hmm. Are there taboos or vices that you would not put money into, even if they fit the criterion of bullpen? That's too abstract a question to really be able to answer. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Let, let's put it this way. We had an LP who invested in us, a very, very important, very big endowment invest in us. And they basically said to us, you know, we're, we're, we like that there's risk in your portfolio. This is good. I think the phrase was something like, you know, if, if you're giving kids handguns, probably we'd be upset with that, mm -hmm. right? You know, it was the example was so over the top insane. You know, if a company comes in and says, let's give six year olds guns, you probably wouldn't do that, right, Paul? I'm like, yes, of course. Mm. But it's an abstract question, mm. and that's why the example was so off the beaten path. Mm. So it's not like we have a list of things on the wall. No, we won't invest in this or this or this. But if a company comes in that's pushing a boundary that makes us uncomfortable, there's no way we're going to invest in that. You think kids should gamble? Uh, no, I think that's a big problem, right? Mm. I actually think the age verification and KYC requirements, I, I think those things are required. Mm. I mean, because there is a certain emotional intelligence required, even if you have the mechanics of the game down. Mm. Uh, my six-year-old son is a competent poker player. Right. Uh, we, we play poker for a half hour every night before going to bed. You know, he can play exotic varieties of poker like like Badoogie and Badesi. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Totally. This, this is a six-year-old kid. Totally. And, you know, we, we, we also will will bet $20 a game on one football game every Sunday. And I actually have, have taught him how to understand lines, scores, win-loss rates, etc. He has an algorithm he follows to pick the one game to bet every week. And you would agree that's going to be extremely useful to him as he grows up. I think that he is so awesomely positioned for the new data economy that we're in. But does my son have anywhere near the emotional intelligence around spending money, around the, I got to pay my bills? He's six. So, no, I, I think there has to be a regulatory framework around things like not letting six-year-olds actually log into the poker site. Hmm. But, you know doing a friendly wager with your dad and playing the game and understanding the mechanics so that when you turn 21, it'll be the greatest day of your life, which we joke about. Hmm. My daughter, by the way, she also plays. I did my 40th birthday in Atlantic City. Uh, my, my mom has a little slot machine in her house. And uh, I, I, I think one of the proudest days of my life is the following. We walk in, we're at the, uh, the Borgata going into my dinner. And of course, the kids are allowed to go to the restaurant. She walks up to one of the slot machines and starts trying to play with it. I tell her, I said, no, Vanessa, you're not allowed to play with the slot machine. And she burst out into tears. Oh. <laughs> she bursts into tears. And I say to myself, I'm like, no, Vanessa, like, you're not allowed to play until you're 21. And she does the math in her head. She's like, that's a long time from now, daddy. She just keeps crying. But it's right. It needs to be something that your six and eight-year-old aren't. But her understanding the mechanics of how the slot machine, that's good for the rest of her life. Don't you feel like something gets lost there though because so i you know i played when it was uh gray legality or it was definitely like it was it was definitely illegal to play underage uh but i i played some underage you know I, if people are listening to this and they come after me then maybe i'll get some of my money taken away but i played when i was like 15 or 16 online and it was so useful to me those nights where you lost a couple thousand dollars and you're a teenager and you you go to and it's hard to go to sleep and it's painful but it builds up ca emotional calluses and it's so useful today i mean i it was freaking painful back then but now i look back on it and i'm like man i had such an e i have such an edge on a lot of people because they have not had that kind of 
you know tra- traumatic financial experience and I don't know I just I almost wish more people were exposed to it okay so I will posit something slightly different and I'll tell this almost like a Zen master who Randy Komisar would do this so I had a ninth grade science teacher who was my biggest mentor and every once in a while he would give you an assignment and you kind of would think about it for a minute and you go he doesn't really want us to do this assignment does he and you'd go why did you ask us to do that and he'd kind of smirk a little bit and you started figuring out after a couple of these assignments he wanted you to kind of do the subversive thing that he wasn't asking you to do mm-hmm. so that he could teach you that sometimes not paying attention to authority was an important thing mm-hmm. now later in life him and I have become personal friends my kids go over and swim in his pool and so it must have been 20 years later in my life, I finally got to ask him. I said, Tom, his name's Tom Cram, like he was my, literally my ninth grade science teacher. I said, we always thought that. He said, you're damn right that's what I was doing. We had to teach you smart kids that sometimes not paying attention to authority and doing the opposite of what was asked is the way to become a better person. It's a way to become a thing like an entrepreneur, which is what you've done. So let me take that story and posit something else. Yes, you learned life lessons around winning and losing money that were important. But you also learned about pushing a boundary and doing something that was technically illegal. I'll bet in some ways you got more out of that hmm. than you did out of the, I learned how to deal with the money. You, you know, I, okay, I'm not supposed to do that, but I'm going to do that anyway right and i will deal with the repercussions if i go to jail <laughs> there's a certain there's a certain thing about that that me and my wife struggle and ask ourselves mm-hmm. with how do we teach that right to your kids because you can't you can't just be frontal about this you can't just come home and go kids i want you to go break the law tomorrow right at the same point in time you kind of want them to push the boundary to do exactly what you did when you were 15 and 16 like Yeah, I don't doubt it. I'm actually positive you're partly the person you are because you did that when you were 15 and 16. Right. And if the equivalent thing happened in my son's life at 15 or 16, you know, I might spank him, but I'd sit there and go, I'm proud of him, right? (laughs) Right. But I think our society does a very, very bad job of promoting this subversive gene or whatever you want to call it. The original code name, by the way, of Bullpen was Subversive Ventures. Mm. It's our, it was a running joke that we would do something subversive. And so that's a very proud statement. I would love to see a way to institutionalize in a smart way getting kids to have that edge that you learned. Very hard to do. They don't right. have an answer. Right. But, but I'll bet the edge of the pushing the boundary taught you a lot more too. Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to companies being subversive, what are the what are the thoughts that you have on that today? Because there's you know you think about kind of the consequences of an Uber or a Zenefits being uh, a little bit too subversive in you know how they approach the law, but you know there are other companies that have. You know, taking advantage to pushing the gray area in a certain direction. Maybe you could even say like the companies that are doing ICOs right now uh, that could work out very well for them. I don't know how how does this apply to your you know the the advice that you give to companies? Going into ex- we actually are pretty clear about this with our companies. Mm-hmm. Going into areas that are black, we're never going to support you on never pushing the boundaries on stuff that's gray. Yeah, we got your back. Like, let's go get an informed legal. Let's go get an informed legal opinion. Let's analyze the risks. Mm. Obviously, doing stuff in the white, we all do. You know, CEO walks into our office and says, here's this thing I want to go do that is kind of patently illegal. You know, we're going we're gonna to holler at them the same way anybody should holler at them. Mm. CEO walks in and says, it is unclear if this framework applies to what we're going to go do. Let's go do it. Uh, we're going to pat them on the back almost every time. And so I think that there is, there is an informed, thoughtful, market-understood way to go into gray areas that we're quite comfortable with. And it requires real thinking, forethought, opinions, planning. Hmm. So we have a company right now considering an ICO right now. We're doing the same thing with that company. That company is a perfect fit for an ICO due to the nature of its underlying business. Uh, but we're pushing. I'm asking that CEO questions to make sure he understands what the downstream risks are to doing 
such a newfangled thing. He's taken it. He's become a student of it. His grasp of it is tremendous. Yes. God bless you. Go do it. Yeah. On the other hand, I'm going to cavalierly do this. Oh, everyone's doing it. Oh, it's cool. Uh, Never going to support that. Yeah. Okay. Coming back to poker, did you expect to see a computer beat a human in Heads Up, No Limit Hold'em? Yeah, so that's an, that's an interesting question. I'm not familiar enough with how that system was built to really answer that question. I spent a lot of time understanding how AlphaGo really worked when it, when it, when it won Go. I, I spent a tremendous amount of time at, at looking at that particular actual implementation and equivalent type systems. I actually sat down and read the code of a couple systems. I was mm. so intrigued by it. And I, I still actually am a pretty proficient C++ high-performance coder if I really need to break that out. A lot of these systems are still in that language, by the way. Am I surprised? No, that the, the heads up realm has got, to some extent, it's information theoretically constrained enough that it's not super surprising. Hmm. There's nuance that the multiplayer game has that are different. Is it conceivable that that would also be, quote, solved? The other question is, what does it truly mean to be solved in the context of an imperfect information game, right? Does it mean I win most of the time when I sit down, right? It's still a probabilistic game. Well, but the thing about poker is it's only 52 cards. Even if it's imperfect information, yeah. it's pretty easy to enumerate. Yeah. I mean, it maybe it takes up a lot of space. Right. That's enumerate. what I'm saying. There's, but you can enumerate yeah, it. There's a Shannon's Law reason why it's not super surprising. What's Shannon's Law? Shannon's Law is just in information theory. So the way you kind of figure out the debt, there are many aspects of it, but one of the ways that you basically figure out what the density of information is. Mm. So you can analytically look at a problem and go, well, that's going to be solvable or not, because yeah. from an information theory standpoint, there's only so many answers, so I could just enumerate them all. Right. So, so at some point, if you can just enumerate them all, it can't really be that hard. Yeah. Um, and so you can apply information theoretic filters on a problem to see which problems will or will not, which is why people were so dang surprised that AlphaGo won. Mm -hmm. Because people viewed that from an information theory standpoint as too unconstrained a problem to ever be able to do something via any aspect of enumeration. Which, of yeah. course, that's not the way it was done. But... People thought that problem might be decades away from solving. Mm -hmm. And it was done by, I guess, like, re it was reinforcement learning, right? It wasn't wasn't really, like, enumerating all the decisions. In, in, no, in no way, shape, or form. The fact, that the, the fact that the pruning of the space could be done so efficiently, I think, maybe is still a surprise. I'm not an AI guy. That's yeah. not really my back. I am an HPC guy. So, like... I get the HPC part of it really well. I don't get the AI part of it near as well. You'd have to talk to somebody else on that one. Okay. Well, you have played a lot of poker. What are the parallels between poker and venture capital? Uh, they're both involve embracing and understanding risk. I've said this many times in interviews. One of the things I've learned being both a poker player, a CEO, and now an investor is... The vast majority of people you meet do not understand and do not embrace risk in any way, shape, or form right. with any aspect of their life. Right. Walking across the street to taking out a bank account to the job they take. Yeah. If, if, you, if you line up 100 people and ask them about aspects of their life, you will find that the risk level in 90% of them is zero. Yeah. It's not even like one on a one to 10. It's truly zero. Yeah. Um, and so I think this ability to embrace, quantify, right. and live with the risk is the unifying aspect of all of those items. And it's an ability or a skill or an insanity few of us actually have. And oh, by the way, it's also kind of funny. You see thrill seekers who are skydivers, et cetera, frequently don't understand risk either, <laughs> which, which is this, like, I'll talk to them about risk, like, in a, in a kind of like, in a no, oh, dude, let's, it's, it's exhilarating. Let's go jump out of an airplane. I'm like, okay, let's talk about risk. Like, right. well, what's your day job? And, and then you realize, it's weird. That guy jumps out of a plane, but actually doesn't understand risk in any way, shape, or form. And I am continually surprised by how many people I engage with on a daily basis, in spite of the business I'm in, yeah. that know a damn thing about what risk is. Hmm. 
So like venture capitalists, they're not making expected value calculations on a regular basis? I still don't think the vast majority of them understand what risk is. My brand is awesome. I will find big companies. Good things will happen. Okay, well, what are you risking then? What's on the line? Hey, hey, big, hey, big fund with brand. What, what's on the line? Hmm. Oh, you might not have future carry in a big outcome? Hmm. Okay, how about we play a different big fund? If you lose the money, I come and take your house. Hmm. I'm not saying it would work that way. I'm not, I'm not saying that that would be the way to run a venture firm. But imagine how you'd make decisions if the risk reward ratio were set up more like that. Yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, is the way it is when you are a starving entrepreneur and you've not had a big exit, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there are ways in which the venture business even insulates itself from risk in an unhealthy way. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, it's late 2017. You started Bullpen in 2010. What has changed in the funding landscape since that time? The biggest one is very simple. The milestones, requirements, and sizes of the downstream funds from us have gone from high to crazy to obscene at this point. So when we start the fund, the round after us is a 5 to $8 million round for a company doing a million in revenue. Seven years later, the round after us is a $20 million round and a company doing 5 to $10 million in revenue. This is a very important lesson for entrepreneurs listening. It means that the milestones required to get these rounds done might be way higher than you're really contemplating when you look at your use of proceeds off your million or $2 million of seed money you got. Because those funds, they don't want to write a $5 million check anymore. That fund used to be a $200 million check writing $5 million checks. That's now an $800 million fund writing $20 million checks. Since they're not down with risk, guess what? You better show them a hell of a lot more before you ask for their money. Mm. Last question, what are the trends in computer science and software engineering that you're most excited about right now? You know, it's funny, I, I'm not qualified to answer that particular one right hmm. now. I actually, we are involved in a couple core technology investments. We're in a data center acceleration layer. We're not afraid to go into core tech, but we actually had this conversation last, actually over the summer. We do not have anything in our portfolio that I would describe in the software engineering stack. Hmm. You know, there are no dockers, there are no, what's my thesis on containers, what's my new, for whatever reason, <laughs> we have not seen any of those companies in our office. We have seen core tech though. It's not like we're only going to do direct to consumer fluffy stuff. Don't yeah. get me wrong. But we haven't seen that part of the stack in mm. our office. And I think it's because that part of the stack is very sexy. Yeah. To some extent. Bullpen is always investing in the categories that are a little bit unsexy. Right. So once software stack becomes unsexy, which everything's cyclic, it will. Maybe I'll have a deep thesis on that because we're in a bunch of companies doing that. But right now, those companies are getting bid up to crazy prices. And entrepreneurs with those backgrounds are raising money before products are built. So guess what? The Moneyball guys are probably not going to be in that category right More now. What about Citus Data? Yeah, well, Citus, again, though, a really core technology piece. Uh, a low level fundamental piece of, of a database technology. I wouldn't call it in the software stack, hmm. right? When, when I really think about the product development life cycle, the you know, efficiency as an engineer, having a badass database at the bottom feels like an infrastructure <laughs> piece that we kind of get. Okay. Well, Paul, uh, thanks for taking the time. It's been great talking to you. Awesome, thanks for the time. Okay, wonderful. At Software Engineering Daily, we need to keep our metrics reliable. If a botnet started listening to all of our episodes and we had nothing to stop it, our statistics would be corrupted. We would have no way to know whether a listen came from a bot or a real user. And that's why we use Encapsula, to stop attackers and improve performance. When a listener makes a request to play an episode of Software Engineering Daily, Encapsula checks that request before it reaches our servers, and it filters the bot traffic, preventing it from ever reaching us. Botnets and DDoS attacks are not just a threat to podcasts. They can impact your application too. Encapsula can protect API servers and microservices from responding to unwanted requests. To try Encapsula for yourself, go to Encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts and get a free enterprise trial of Encapsula. Encapsula's API gives you control over the security and performance of your application, and that's true whether you have a complex microservices architecture 
or a WordPress site, like Software Engineering Daily. Encapsula has a global network of over 30 data centers that optimize routing and cache your content. The same network of data centers are filtering your content for attackers, and they're operating as a CDN, and they're speeding up your application. They're doing all of this for you, and you can try it today for free by going to Encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts, and you can get that free enterprise trial of Encapsula. That's Encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts to check it out. Thanks again, Encapsula. Wow. 